This parable of the lost sheep is one of the most well-known parables Jesus ever told. A lot of people are familiar with the parable, even if they didn't know it. Most of us have seen, at some point or another in our life, a picture of Jesus holding a lamb. Sometimes the picture is even more accurate and descriptive of Luke chapter 15, where Jesus has the lamb on his shoulders. We've seen it, whether it might be a painting. I've been in a church before where I saw it depicted in stained glass. It was super cool. It's a well-known parable, and it's a beautiful parable. I mean, it's a really, really great story about finding a lost sheep. It's a beautiful story about a shepherd that goes after the one that's wandered astray, It ends with rejoicing of the shepherd and of his friends, and Jesus says, this is what it's like in heaven when somebody gets saved. It's a really, really great parable. This morning, we're going to learn a few things from it. What I want to note is that the parable itself is Jesus' response to grumbling Pharisees. The Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the the, uh, scribes, these people were constantly criticizing Jesus for who he hung out with. They hated Jesus for a lot of reasons. They despised him because of the power that he had. He demonstrated a power consistently that they had never known anything about. They despised Jesus because of the authority that he spoke with. People listened to Jesus when he talked. They despised him because of his message. But you will find that one of the most documented things that these Pharisees criticized Jesus for was who he hung out with. It's as if they could not wrap their mind around how in the world this supposed man from God would spend time with these people. Sometimes it's like, if you had any idea who that woman was, you would not let her be anointing you right now. Sometimes that's the accusation. Sometimes it's he eats with tax collectors and sinners. But it is a repeated theme where they are constantly accusing Jesus of being with the wrong people, and in response to their grumbling about him being with the wrong people, Jesus gives them this parable. No doubt, then, the parable is designed to deal with the attitude of their heart. That's what Jesus is really trying to do here. He's almost, he's like he's flipping the table, and he says, no, let's deal with you. You Pharisees, your hearts need changed. Your attitude is wrong. And I want to talk to you this morning about the outlook of the heart, the attitude of the heart. I want to, just using our text, I want to look at what I will call three attitudes of the heart that are revealed here in the parable of the lost sheep. One of them is negative, two of them are positive. First, let's get the negative attitude of the heart out of the way. Number one, we see that hypocrites grumble when others come first. Now, I use the word hypocrites. I want, I originally, when I wrote this point out, I had the word Pharisees, because it's Pharisees and scribes in our text. But we are often really quick to be like, well, that's, I'm not a Pharisee. Jesus repeatedly called the Pharisees hypocrites. And so this is a fair interpretation of this verse, and I want to use hypocrites because it's a little bit more wide range. All of us, brothers and sisters, have a hypocrite inside that tries to come out when we feel wronged. Now, these hypocrites simply could not understand why God would care for sinners. After all, what could these sinners possibly have to offer to God? They had in view a God 
who could not be around filthy sinners unlike them. But the reality is, the Pharisees were sinners, folks, just like everybody else. And here's what you'll find about hypocrisy when it begins to to fester in the heart. Hypocrisy has this unbelievable ability to hate that sin, but excuse my own. To point out this wrong and that wrong and that wrong and that wrong and then make excuses for my own. In fact, the, 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 the heart of hypocrisy is an absolute master at disguising its hypocrisy. We're masters of it in the church, folks. Just like the Pharisees, we can, we can make it sound spiritual. The Pharisees' argument, though it's not recorded for us here, the Pharisees' argument is basically that God is holy. That God is so pure and so holy, He would not be with these filthy sinners. It sounds good on the surface. It sounds right on the surface. It sounds very religious. But when you get to the heart of the matter, you see that it's a bunch of garbage. These same people are plotting the murder of Jesus. And these same people seem to believe that God would, if God were to really send his son here, If a man was really sinned from God, he wouldn't be hanging out with those sinners. He'd be hanging out with us. These are the same people that are plotting the murder of an innocent man. You see how hypocrisy justifies my sins while willing to crucify someone else for theirs. And when you get through the baloney of it, you realize at the end of the day, what this is really about, this is about selfishness. These Pharisees just felt like, hey, well, we have, hold on a second. Now, we are the spiritual ones here. We're the ones who have been in church our whole lives. We're the ones who can quote the scriptures. We're the ones that when people want to understand what the Bible says, they come to us. And so they were offended that Jesus wasn't fascinated with them and giving them all of his time. And so one of the attitudes of the heart that's revealed here is that hypocrisy the attitude of hypocrisy, we become grumblers when other people come first. Now, I want to make this practical for you and I. So the message is for us this morning, and here's the warning. It's really the only warning of the message this morning. We have to guard our hearts against this hypocrisy. And when you find yourself becoming angry or frustrated, and here's the right word for it, even though we would try to use a different term, jealous because somebody else is getting attention and you're not, we've got to check our heart and and, and be real honest about what's going on in here. I've seen it happen over the years uh, in ministry. I've been doing ministry now for 22 years uh, here at the well since 2006 and then about five and a half years of ministry in uh, Wellington. And I'm just telling you, over 22 years, I've seen it a handful of times People, that they sound spiritual, but they're not. They're just critical. And if they, when, when you really get through the baloney of it all, they're just jealous. They just, you know, they don't understand why, why does somebody else get time? Why does somebody else get this? Why does somebody else get that? You know, why, why, why are you guys, um, you know, why are you out doing, uh, I've literally been asked this question, literally. Why do you guys go out and do so much uh, mission work why don't you care for the people of your own community? I'm like, well, what do you think we do every Sunday here? And Wednesday. And about 200 Tuesdays a year. And at Christmas time. And at Thanksgiving. Like, what do you think we do here? You, you, I, I don't understand. Like, this is such a dumb question. And you'll find that most of these grumblers, they're never actually out doing the work. They're never out actually serving. But there's just a sense of jealousy that that I should be the source of attention. 
And at the heart of it, that's what these Pharisees were so frustrated about. That's what these hypocrites were so frustrated about. They weren't getting attention that they felt like they deserved. And I just want to encourage us this morning. I want to challenge us this morning to recognize that at times, that little heart of hypocrisy, it tries to creep up in all of us. And knowing what it is and seeing it for what it is will help you to put it to rest a whole lot faster. Because if you don't, and you don't identify it, as I've already said, the heart of hypocrisy is the master of spiritualizing why we feel the way we feel. We've got to recognize it for what it is. We've got to put a stop to it, put an end to it, and not do it. We see that's really what this parable is about, Jesus responding to this attitude. But as we look within the parable, there's a couple of other really great attitudes that I want us to examine this morning. The second attitude I want us to see is this. God's servants embrace the cost of rescue. God's servants embrace the cost of rescue. So Jesus uses this illustration of rescuing a lost sheep. Here, we are the lost sheep, and he is the shepherd who goes to rescue us. And all of these people that he's giving this parable to, they would have understood the parable, they would have related to the parable. And so there's some things that are like just understood by the hearers that we might not think about. And I want to just kind of examine those things. Leaving the 99 and going by yourself to try to find a lost sheep, you do not know where it is, you're out in the open wilderness, there's some risk involved there. It can be dangerous. There's no telling exactly how long the rescue is going to take. And Jesus said, the shepherd goes and he looks for the sheep, quote, until he finds it. This is a, this is a uh, it, 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 the attitude that Jesus is speaking of here is an attitude of rescue that says, I'm going to do what it takes, uh, no matter how long it takes, no matter how far I have to go, no matter how much this thing costs me, I will find this lost sheep of mine. And we see that this is the attitude of the true servant of God. A couple of uh, items of importance here. The rescue mission of God requires searching. We, Jesus said it. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. In the story here, we have this shepherd going and finding the sheep. In the story that follows, you have a woman with a lost coin searching until she finds it. And this is a really important part of understanding biblical evangelism. We have to go to where people are. Jesus did not just set up some building and invite people to come. You hear me say this over and over and over and over again. I thank God for the church. It's part of the Christian faith. We need to be committed to the local church. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together on a regular weekly basis. It's very important. It's vital to your Christian health. But God's design for the growth of the church was never that we erect buildings and just hope that sinners are going to wake up on Sunday morning and think, today's a good day to go to church. That is a terrible model for expanding the kingdom of God. We have to search. Jesus gives this example of the servant searching, going out searching for the lost. This is the heart of rescue. People who need rescued typically can't rescue themselves or they wouldn't need rescued. Now, I want you to note something that's really important, in my opinion, very, very, very important about our text. The Bible says that the accusation was this, and I quote, this man eats with sinners. That's the question at hand here. Jesus says, oh, I'm not eating. No, I, I'm a shepherd out looking for lost sheep. Now, I want you to see it. 
I'm a fan. I really am. I'm a fan of street preaching. I am a fan of going to people to where they are and trying to have one-on-one conversations and win them to the Lord like that. I am a fan of that, but I want you to understand something. Jesus says that most of this rescuing here happens in the context of meaningful relationships. You all want to say, oh, he's just eating with sinners. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Now, if you think that's what's happening you have lost the entire point here. I'm not just eating with sinners. I'm investing into their lives. I'm sitting with them and I'm listening to them. And I'm having meaningful conversation. We as the church must find ways to sit and eat with sinners. And if we don't, you will find that we almost never win the lost. We're not investing into them. We're not letting them know that their lives are meaningful to us. You'll find that, and here's the thing about winning, this, this sermon is really about soul winning. Here's the thing about soul winning, folks. Nobody really gets the credit except God. I'll never forget when I was younger, we used to go to Cedric County Jail and, and preach all the time, sometimes two or three times a week. And I was at a service with Pastor Josh Bush one time, and we had something like 40 guys that came forward and prayed and uh, prayed to accept the Lord into their life. I know that only God knows the ones that were sincere, but I'm telling you something, we sat for an hour afterwards and with a line of guys just wanting to talk with us. I know that many of them were very sincere. The Lord moved that day. It was a very... Great, powerful moment, right? We preach, a lot of people saved. I'll never forget this. For those of you who know Pastor Josh Bush, he's one of the most humblest people you'll ever meet. We are walking down the aisle, or not the aisle, but the hallway after we had left uh, to exit the, the jail, and this is what Josh said. Man, it would look like you and I did a lot of work back there, but we really didn't do anything, did we? I didn't answer because I wasn't real sure what he meant, and so he finished up on his statement. Here's what he said. He said, these guys got mamas that have been praying for it for years. He said, other workers have been up here giving these guys, you know, booklets that they've been reading. And some of these people, these guys got kids that are home praying for them. Some of them got wives that are praying for them. And they're, they're just like ready. They're, they're in a place where they're ready. They're tired of their life. And we show up and it looks like, you know, they respond to us. I will never forget that moment. Because it's right. It's 100% right. So here's the application to this. It might be that you lead somebody to the Lord at a dinner table. It might be that they eventually show up to church and hear the gospel preach and respond to the gospel. It might be that they show up at a small group and sit in through your small group for six to eight weeks. And after six to eight weeks of seeing the way that you all interact and seeing that you care enough to include them into your life and hearing the, the word of God accurately taught, that in that setting they give their life to the Lord. Paul said, you know, one plants and another, one waters and other plants, but God's the one that gives the increase. It doesn't matter who gets the credit. The point that I'm trying to make is that if we aren't taking time to invest in the lost and have conversation with people that need Jesus, we're not going to see people saved, folks. And so there is this searching that is involved in this great rescue of the lost. Rescue is intentional. There is a plan involved. Jesus said, no, I'm not just eating. There's a plan here. Rescue is work sometimes. It is a selfless effort. And I want you to listen to me on this next point. Rescue can be costly. Real rescue almost always requires cost. Consider Christ's cost that he paid to rescue us. I know our minds always go, I say that, your mind immediately goes to the cross. Yes, and we're going to get to the cross. 
But I, what I want to do with the help of God this morning, I want to help you have a sense of awe and wonder for the entire cost. Because Jesus gives this picture of a shepherd like leaving the fold to go after one, but what Jesus did was so much more than that. Consider what he left. You know, on the last night before Jesus died, before he was crucified, in the Gospel of John, it records for us this great big prayer that Jesus prayed. And there's this really interesting, it's interesting to me, there's this real interesting piece inside of that prayer where Jesus prays this prayer. Here's what he says. Father, I pray that my disciples will one day see me in the glory I had before. He's referencing his glory before he came to earth. And he says, I want my disciples to see it. Like all that they've ever seen me do, the, 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 the ceasing of the wind, the calming of the waves, the walking on the water, the healing of the blind, the healing of the lepers, the feeding of the 12,000 plus, the raising of the dead, all that they've ever seen me do, it still does not truly show them the glory that I had beforehand. And he said, I want them to to, to see that. I prayed that they would come to see that. With that in mind, let's consider the cost that Jesus paid to rescue you. He left the splendor of heaven. He left a glory that we have never seen that even the pages of Scripture don't really record for us. He left it to come be born in a manger. Not just did he leave it. He could have left it, and then coming to earth and being born to a king in a king's palace would still be this in, we couldn't even express how humbled he would have been just to become man, period. But he becomes man as a baby born in a manger with animals. Then, how many of you are familiar with the story of Jesus in the temple when he was 12 years old, where his parents forgot him, and he's there teaching the, the leaders? You realize that is the only story we have of Jesus' childhood. And there is no record of the life of Christ until about 30 years old after that one story. So the Son of God leaves the splendor of heaven. He comes to earth to be born in a manger with animals and then lives for 30 years in pretty much absolute obscurity. Talk about laying down his glory so that he could rescue you. And then when he begins preaching at about the age of 30, He knows that soon and very soon, my preaching and my life and my message, it will bring hatred against me. I'm going to be falsely accused. I'm going to be betrayed, and it's ultimately going to lead to my death. It all culminates in this final week of Jesus' life. The Bible tells us, knowing good and well what he was going to endure, that Jesus set his face like a flint or that he set his face like a stone to go to Jerusalem. He wasn't going to be moved to the left or the right. He knew what he was going to endure. He knew the pain that he was going to endure. He knew the death that he was going to die. And he decided, I'm going to go there anyways. And on the final night of his life, about four hours before Jesus is betrayed, Jesus is sitting there with his disciples. And Jesus knows this group of people is about to, to uh, betray me. They're going to abandon me and leave me alone. And you know what Jesus is doing in that moment? With complete knowledge of the torture that he's about to go through, the pain that he's about to endure, the death that he's about to die, and that his disciples are going to abandon him and let him do it alone. You know what Jesus is doing? He's teaching them still. He's just using this opportunity to teach them one last lesson before he has to go. 
I'm telling you, Jesus was awesome. He was a man's man. He was the greatest man that there ever was. His disciples would abandon him. Jesus would be brought, arrested falsely, and brought to a mock trial that was designed with one purpose. Find him guilty of something we can kill him for. False witnesses were paid to lie about him so that they could find a charge worthy of death. They go through their mock trial, they show up to Pilate, and they're like, eh, we tried him, he's worthy of death. Eventually, Pilate has to deal with the situation. Pilate examines him. Pilate comes out and says, he has not done anything worthy of death. I've examined the man. But the mob will not relent. So Pilate thinks to himself, I know what I'll do. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to beat him nearly to the point of death, and I'm going to do it publicly in, in a way that is shameful as all get out, and that will appease this mob. Like, I'm going to try to find a way to save this man's life, but appease the mob. And so Pilate orders that he is beat with the cat of nine tails, 39 lashes, publicly for everybody to watch. And Jesus is tied to a post, and he is beat with this wicked torture device known as the cat of nine tails. This thing is like a whip, and there's really two sections of it. The first section is like lead balls, and when you throw the whip, those lead balls come out first. And they'll hit the body to bruise it. And then when you pull it back, the second section of it, the end of the tail, it just has things tied to it like barbs, you know, glass possibly, but things that were designed to cut. And so this, this lash would go forward. It would hit the body and bruise it and pull it back. And then these sharp spikes would come forward and tear a little bit of flesh off. It's a really torturous device. The Bible says that Jesus was beaten so badly that you could not recognize who he was. Now listen to this. Jesus had to die on the cross for our sins. That beating was just something he had to take on the way to get there. And Jesus knew good and well how he was going to die. And he knew good and well he was going to have to take that beating. He knew all that he was going to endure. And yet, he counted the cost and continued to push forward. He was ultimately nailed to a cross, tied to it, stakes driven through his wrist and through his feet. And he was hung up there to die in front of everybody. And there he eventually breathed his last breath, gave up his very life, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and thank God he didn't stay there. He rose from the dead three days later, defeating death, hell, and the grave, and proving once and for all that he was the almighty son of God. He was exactly who he said he was. But he endured it all that he might pay the cost To save you. There is a cost for rescue. And so I ask you the question this morning. If that was the cost he was willing to pay, what are you willing to pay? What are you willing to give? If you travel the mountains to find your sheep, why Won't you do the same for your fellow man? There is a cost involved. But God's servants embrace the cost of rescue. Number three this morning. This third point is more subtle, but it is certainly here. And I want to draw it out. To become more like Christ. Your faith must become less 
about you. To become more like Christ, your faith must become less about you. So Jesus gives the illustration of the shepherd that leaves it all to find the one. It's clearly a reference to himself and the extent to which he would search for one soul. And then elsewhere, Jesus says, follow me. All are welcome. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. So we see here that if we're going to be like Jesus, our faith has to be about God and what God wants with our life and less about us. See, this was the sin of the Pharisees. Their their faith was about them. When all of a sudden, in their mind, the supposed Son of God shows up and He's not all about them, they just don't get it. You will find that throughout every age of recorded history, the sin of self-worship has found a place. It was the original sin with Satan. His pride was lifted up. But what Satan wanted was to be worshipped. And then when he comes to Eve, the original temptation to sin in the garden was this. You deserve more. You do what you want. You could be more powerful. You could be more wise. You could have more influence. You, 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 you. Who cares what God says? Who cares what God's law is? Who cares what God thinks? Who cares what God told you? You do what you want to do. This was the message to Eve. And the Pharisees were all about self-worship. And it finds itself into every culture. We must guard our hearts against it. If you want to become more like Jesus, your faith will have to become less about you. The same, the same uh, problem of self-worship, it finds itself even in today's modern era church. I'm telling you, it's in every era of time where in so many ways what people are after is what can they get I'll be faithful to God if he'll make me rich. I'll be faithful to God if he'll fix my marriage. I'll be faithful to God if, if, if. A lot of people, when they're looking at what church they want to go to, they could give three rips less about whether or not it's spiritual, whether or not the Holy Ghost is moving. They they don't even ask if anybody's been saved in ages. They don't care. They just want to know if you got coffee or not. What do you got for my kids? What do you got for men? What do you got for women? What do you got for me? What do you got for my children? What do you got for my family? What can I get? 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 And once you get convinced enough, you can get enough from it, then you're willing to commit to it. You're not committing to it. You're worshiping yourself. You're committed to yourself. You've just convinced yourself that this particular move is good for you. What I'm trying to tell you is we've got to guard against this. I'm not against those things. I'm not knocking our ministries. I'm not saying they're bad things. And I like coffee. I'm making the point, though, that we have to guard against self-worship. And that if we truly want to become more like Christ, our faith must become less about us. The question of, God, what should I do It's not about what do I do so that I can get more, so that I can be more wealthy, so that my life can be more happy. The question is, God, what can I do to advance your kingdom? What can I do to rescue the lost? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to have over for dinner this week? I love our church. I think we have one of the greatest churches in Derby. I really do, and I'm not just saying that. I really believe that. I'm going to tell you one of the things that burdens this pastor is how, 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 how often... We lack people visiting because you all invited them to come. 
And I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad here, but when's the last time that a sinner walked in these doors to sit with you because you had taken the time to invest in that person? You guys had had meals together. You had talked to them at your work, or maybe it's a neighbor. When's the last time you personally had somebody sitting beside you at church because you took the time to invest into them? And I'm the one that, I mean, I, I see it, and so it burdens me because what I know is is that, that to a great degree, we're too busy. We don't want to do the effort. Rescue costs too much, too much time, too much energy, too much effort. And so somehow we just hope the church grows without us having to do our own part to, to go search for the lost and win the lost and rescue the lost. And if we're going to be more like Jesus, our faith must become less about us. My neighbor, I'll go ahead and close with this story. Ask our worship team if you guys want to get in place. I've got a neighbor that I'm hoping comes someday. I'm not going to say his name because I don't want to embarrass him. But I hope that he comes. I really believe this guy is going to get saved eventually. Rough around the edges. But he and I have just connected. He's not afraid to talk to me openly. Sometimes he forgets. Yesterday when we were talking, I'm talking seven or eight F-bombs. And I'm like, dude, did you forget that I'm a pastor? We are talking out in front of my house right now. I'm going to wash my ears out after this conversation. But he had driven by my house on, well, on his bike and turned around and came back because I was unloading the trailer with all the stuff from Mexico. And so he pulls back in. He says, where would you go this time? I said, well, we're in water as Mexico this time. He said, man, why do you go there? We had a real conversation about it, about the dangers of it, the risk that's involved. He said, dude, I just don't understand why anybody would go there. And that's what I said. That's why we go. Because most of the rest of the world feels the same way that you do. And the places that we do go, nobody else is. And it's a risk that has been calculated and that we're willing to take. If we're going to be more like Jesus, we're going to have to quit the whole self-preservation. What can I get out of it? So many people see their faith as a means to an end. They want to be obedient to God to the degree they have to, to be blessed more. And here's what's crazy. I mean, it's crazy about it. When you abandon that awful attitude and you get your heart right, and you start serving God because He's worthy to be served and because He's good and you want to advance His kingdom, here's what's wild about it. He does bless you. That's just the way it works. But when the heart is wrong and the motive is selfish, it's ineffective. It doesn't work. I pray that we as a people develop a real desire to win the lost a sense of urgency that of everything that we do nothing actually matters more than rescuing the perishing Jesus came to seek and save the lost that's what he came to do I pray the Holy Spirit will help us to stay focused on that and not get off into the weeds of lesser important things I pray that each of us as families will look for ways to eat with sinners. When's the last time you consciously look for a way to do that? To sit down and spend time with people who need Jesus. I want to close with uh, just addressing two groups of people. First of all, this morning, if you're here and you're not saved, if you're watching online and you know it in the depth of your heart, you're not right with God, would you please listen to me right now? I could never properly express how much God loves you. Jesus has demonstrated his love for you through the cost that he paid to rescue you. 
Jesus has gone to the ends of the earth to rescue you. And if you want to know what the will of God is for your life, it's this. The will of God for your life is to rescue you. He wants to save you. He loves you. And if that is you, I plead with you. Turn your heart to the Lord. Come to Jesus. Be willing to cry out and just say, God, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I repent. I turn to you. Save me. This morning, if that's you and you happen to be here in this service, I plead with you in just a moment when you have the opportunity to do so, whether it's right there in your seat, whether you want to turn around and kneel, or whether you want to get up out of your seat and work your way down to the front of this church and find a place to kneel at one of these altars, I just plead with you, you pray to God this morning and you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And to the church, to the saint this morning, let us be careful of the leaven of self-worship. Let us be cautious of letting our faith become about us. And secondly, are you part of the great rescue? What are you doing in your own life to fulfill the great commission of Christ to go into all the world and make disciples?